Next, we'd like to move on to keynotes. The first keynote will be delivered by the head of the Renewable Energy Division of International Energy Agency, or IEA, Dr. Paolo Franco, who will deliver his keynote. Over to you, Dr. Franco, please. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. And uh, let me, first of all, express how honored I am to represent the International Energy Agency today in the occasion of this very important anniversary. As it was said, the IA is just a few months older than the Sunshine Project. We were born in February for the same reason, which is the oil crisis. Now, I will take this in the next 20 minutes or so. I would like to share with you our perspective of what is needed to go to a net zero world in 2050 and what is the role of renewables. Now, the first observation is that something has not changed in 50 years. This is the share of fossil fuels in energy, in primary energy. This is not on the slide, but it has remained exactly the same at 80 percent. Despite all the evolution of renewables, of energy efficiency, of nuclear, of everything, this has not changed. Now, this needs to radically change in the next 25 years. And the emissions at global level needs to be almost halved already by 2030 and go then to zero uh, in 2050. We know very well that this will start with the power sector. This is true everywhere. And then, then we will have to tackle with so-called hard to debate sectors like industry, transport and buildings. It was mentioned energy efficiency before. Energy efficiency remains the first fuel for the IEA. In, in our net zero uh, scenario, the total energy actually diminishes by 10% compared to today, while the GDP of the world more than doubles. And then the, after we do the energy efficiency, or let's say in parallel, the renewable energy becomes very important with 30% in total final consumption by 2030 and over 70% in 2050. A major role is for electricity, because while total energy uh, goes down, electricity triples between 2020 and 2050. And we will need all forms of uh, uh, clean electricity, including nuclear, including hydro, including fossil fuel plus CCUS. But once in our scenario, something is very clear, by 2050, according to our data now, 90%, 90 of the electricity will be provided by renewables globally and 70% by variable renewables, solar and wind, which of course brings uh, then uh, issues of system integration. Now, at that time, we think electricity will surpass 50% of total final consumption, but this means that the other 50%, we need green molecules. And those molecules either come from fossil fuels plus CCUS or from hydrogen, which is in this map. We, we map the whole world for the cost of production of hydrogen in 2030 and 2050, or from sustainable biofuels, or from the combination of all these forms that can also lead to uh, um, e-fuels. Now, these are long-term scenarios, and I will not spend more time, and I would like to spend how are we progressing? In terms of renewable power, we are progressing pretty well. We are doing a market forecast every year. And in our latest forecast, we show that in the next five years, the world is going to set new renewable power equal to the whole cumulative power installed in history, including hydro. This is absolutely driven by solar PV, as you can see. And actually, it is in particular driven by solar PV in China. I will come to this in a moment. Uh, solar PV is actually going to be 70% of the total capacity installed in the next five years. These are, of course, good news. In terms of countries, China is the absolute leader. I would like to be super factual, not making any comments if they were done in the past, in the previous presentation about also supply chain con, uh, constraints and industrial policies, but it's a fact 
that nobody else in the world at the moment is investing like uh, China. This is, uh, the renewables are going to grow everywhere in the European Union, in the United States, in India. All these four countries together, four regions account for 85% of the oil capacity, but also the rest of the world is growing. Last year at COP, there was an incredible important target, which is the tripling power capacity by 2030, which is of course very ambitious, but according to our forecast, with the policies that are in place now and the market conditions that are in place now, we are not that far. We would be probably at 2.5, of course, if the policies are implemented. But even more, we have a case in our forecast, which is called the accelerated case, which looks at policies like uh, faster permitting, uh, enhancing grids, that if implemented in the next 12 to 24 months, have a very concrete advantage in terms of deployment by 2030, and we can go even faster and go almost to 2.8. The reminder part is in particular in developing countries which have no policies and no support for renewables nowhere and where the cost of financing is very high. For that, very quickly, I would like just to mention that we have published and it's live on our website, our renewable power energy progress tracker, which looks at every at 60 countries uh, giving uh, a lot of indicators from here to 2028. And you can see this in the uh, website. This is just um, an example of the country of Denmark. And I will come back on Denmark as well. So renewable power is progressing, let's say, well. But on the fuels, this is another story. All the sustainable fuels are radically off track from 2030 goals. The sustainable biofuels are the more mature, they're growing, but not growing fast enough, not at all. Biogas has a potential which is recognized in many parts of the world, but also not progressing. And hydrogen and fuels are very promising, but they have a number of difficulties in terms of infrastructure and creation of demand. And so they are going actually, they're progressing much, much slower than they should in the coming uh, years. And I would like to come back to the two of the heart of bait sectors, in particular transport with aviation and shipping and industry, where these sustainable fuels in all forms, sustainable fuels, hydrogen derived fuels, so hydrogen, ammonia, e-fuels, and also uh, uh, e-fuels play an important role. In, in industry, they also play a very important role, according, or of course, all of, in all these cases, they're complementary to electric, uh, electricity and energy efficiency. Now, going on hydrogen, one of the reasons which is also an obstacle to hydrogen is transport. And Japan was among the first to realize that actually, if hydrogen and the right fuels need to be transported by shipping, then ammonia is an, an important player. And I would like to praise Japan for this because this has actually spread out in the world. We were discussing before about the fact that Japan is testing co-firing or substitution of coal with ammonia and other European countries in power plants and other European countries like Germany are looking now at this with clear interest. Now, we did a number of studies, and we actually think that by 2030, ammonia production could be competitive with the fossil fuel route. If you look, uh, we looked at different countries where this could be uh, produced, and we did a special study for Oman, which has actually a very high potential to produce ammonia at interesting costs. But once again, one thing that needs not to be forgotten is the need for appropriate infrastructure. And the latest of our studies was on e-fuels that we discussed and we published in last December. And of course, as you know, the cost of e-fuels depend on two main variables. The cost of the electricity, of low carbon electricity, be it from renewables or from nuclear, and the cost of electrolyzers. And of course, to have a capacity factor of the source of the electricity, which is high enough. 
We believe that by 2030, there could be conditions to have e-fuels at $50 per gigajoule. This, of course, is still much more expensive than fossil fuels, but could have markets in, for instance, in aviation or in shipping, if the right policies of support are done. Now, a number of opportunities and challenges ahead, and I would like now to focus one second on system integration. Because given the fact that the cheapest option of renewables are solar PV and wind, and they are both variable, there has been immediately from the very beginning, big discussion on how can we make sure that system integration is cost efficient and secure. And I'm showing this graph, which shows by 2028, what is the share of variable renewables in some countries? And look at the right. Denmark will probably reach 90%, 9-0 of variable renewables generation. And this is only possible because of the grid and the good interconnection with the neighboring countries, which is of, of course an issue in Japan. But look at the other countries, at the European countries that will reach 40 and 50%. And there is one, Ireland, which has situation which is not far away from that of Japan, because it has only one rather small interconnected with the UK. So there are many, the IA has for a long time uh, invent, uh, proposed a classification of phases for system integration. I will not go more in detail, uh, but I'm just saying that many technology solutions exist even to ensure the stability of the system at very high um, at very high shares of variable renewables. There is one part, however, which is still unsolved, and this is the seasonal variability. And here I would like to thank the Japanese government for the support and for asking us to work on this in connection of the G7 last year, and then there was a second phase of the study this year. And in a nutshell, look at the central figure and the figure on the right. For short duration storage, no doubt batteries are doing an incredible progress. There is also a lot of space for demand side response. We did this study for different climatic zones in the world, but it, when it comes to seasonal flexibility, then at this moment, we only know two solutions, either hydropower, for those countries that have hydropower or thermal power plants. Of course, these thermal power plants in the future may be fueled by hydrogen or by ammonia, by low carbon fuels. But at this moment, this is one of the most challenging issues for renewable power, which remains to be solved. One of the topic, innovative topic, which is not in the slide, is the emergency of new type of storages, nor in particular thermal energy storage, which uh, recently has seen many startups coming up in California, which is an interesting evolution. Hydrogen. Previous speakers have mentioned hydrogen many times. Hydrogen was part of the Sunshine Project from the beginning and actually also of the programs of the US DOE. But still, we only observe that it is going very slowly. And actually the unconvenient truth is that from all the project pipelines, only 7% today have reached final investment decisions. And there is one main reason for that, which is that the policy support has focused a lot on supply, but much less on demand and less on transport and infrastructure. And this is one of the next urgencies to go uh, much faster on hydrogen in the coming years. My, I could not finish this intervention without mentioning a crucial world, which is innovation and emerging technologies, some of which were just mentioned by the previous speakers, going from perovskites in PV to floating wind offshore, but also ocean energy and enhanced geothermal energy, which are very promising for renewables. This is one family of technology. The other families of technologies they are the one that enable a much faster evolution of renewables. That's exactly the electric thermal energy storage, 
These are synchronous condensers or grid forming uh, devices for uh, stabilizing the grid. These are the different forms of battery storage and don't forget biofuels and in particular the advanced biofuels from lignocellulizic uh, feedstocks. The very early, starting from 75, the IA started to do so-called technology collaboration programs. There are now 12 active on renewables, and it was mentioned before that NATO participate in 11 of the TCPs of the IA, and we welcome very much this collaboration. It is through this network of experts that the Secretariat has access to the um, technology knowledge and innovation, which will fundamentally important to reach the objective by 2050. Now, I have to conclude with some remarks on our 50th birthday. There was the ministerial meeting back in February, and one part of this was important because it was the first ever energy innovation forum. And the bullet point, which is the most important in this slide, is the third one. More than 70 companies and startups were present. These companies have usually the best ideas, not necessarily the capital, and they very rarely have the occasion to speak with the IA or to speak with the IA ministers, and this was an event where they had the chance to do so and to present new ideas, and I hope we are deciding right now to do this on an annual basis, and I hope very soon that in the next event we will host maybe some Japanese companies that come speaking to us on perovskites or wind, offshore wind. Um, I will not go absolutely in detail, but I just want to highlight that in the ministerial communique, ministers give, gave many mandates to the IA to work on renewables, on markets, on policies, on technologies, on storage, on hydrogen and the derivatives, on fuels, and on air and in R and D and D objectives, and I would like to mention one thing, which is important with for Asia. In October, the IA will, for the first time, open a second office in Singapore. And this is actually my last slide. This is a photograph of my, of our ministers in our anniversary of the 50th year. With that, I would like to wish the same happy birthday. And more importantly, to wish a long collaboration between the IA and NATO in the future. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. NATO.